Hi guys, welcome to our show. It's called The Poolin' Around Show. My name is Sean King. Behind the camera, we've got Chris Wilmoth. And we interview top players, pool room owners, case makers, cue makers uh, in the sport of pool. And we ask them questions. Uh, we want to know what your questions are after this interview uh, for maybe even a follow-up. So please like, uh, subscribe, and share this channel so that we can keep producing uh, more great interviews. So today, we're sitting uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma with um, a man named Jim McDermott, who you may or may not be familiar with, but if you haven't heard of Jim McDermott, you've probably definitely heard of a place called the Billiard Palace in Tulsa, or Magoo's, uh, which I consider the mecca of pool for almost a decade. So we set this we set this interview up what like a week or two ago. Yeah, and I'm really really happy he's played shape on the interview. There's probably a hundred pictures in here that we absolutely want to get a shot of. We'll add those into the video at the end or later. But you're likely going to hear I've got a picture of that, um, and we'll get those pictures in the video. So we'll focus on Jim. I've got a few generic questions to ask, but we really want to um, hear the stories and let you do most of the talking. Um, so don't be afraid to go on and on about anything. We, I don't think we have to be anywhere, um, but I, I do want to cover from and when we, you were young we till now. You us. Yeah, thank you so much. Nice, and fun. thank you to Michelle McDermott, my friend and Jim's daughter, uh, for, for helping us set this up. Thank you so much, Michelle. All right. First question. How old are you? I'm seven, I'll be 77 in a week. 77. And then what age were you when you, when you first saw a pool table got involved? I was uh, 13 years old when my dad took me in the first pool room. I fell in love. I've been a pool hall bum ever since. Pool hall bum? Yep. Proud of it. So your dad? Dad took me took in. Took you in. Um, well, I think he was sorry later because uh, I started skipping school and uh, you know I, I spent all my time in the pool room after that. Well, I think he'd probably be proud of you now after it's all said and done. Yeah, I hope so. He's been passed for a long time, but he liked pool. And uh, I, what happened was I was a marble player when I was you know younger than that, and lo loved playing marbles. And I walked in that pool room and saw those big marbles on that green cloth. It was, I was just mesmerized. So you could control your ball like your marble. Yeah, and I, then I you, was a good marble player. Yeah, you know, some people play golf and then they play pool, but I never thought about a marble player well, becoming you know, a pool player. That's pretty. You, we really? got to look at the times. You know, you're, you're talking. We're talking sixty years ago. Okay. And there was a lot of marbles back in them days. A lot of them. Can you still play? No, I haven't played since I walked in the pool room. I don't even time. know how to play. Yeah. Well, there's different games, rings and holes. They got different. So was your dad a good player? No. He just liked the game. He was he was uh, he was a machinist. Tool and die maker. So he takes you in there once and it was done. You go pool pool bum, you said ever since. Yeah, I would run home uh, every uh, school day uh, at lunch. Play two games of snooker and a game of nine ball. Run back to the school. I'd be five minutes late for Mrs. Aaron's class. Yeah. That's, okay. And that's that was my routine. Who were you playing with? Did you have a friend that you played with? I had a couple. Uh, a guy that uh, his dad was the head of the uh, Osage Agency there in Pawhuska, Oklahoma. Pawhuska. Yeah, that's where I grew up. And uh, his name was Earl Schrock. And he, he went to college same time I did. And as a matter of fact, I ran into him again in college. And he uh, had a job when I first opened my first uh, pool room here in Tulsa, where he was making, this was early 70s, middle 70s. He was making 40000 a year. But he'd gone through a divorce, and Earl just, he came to me and said, Jim, I want to go to work for you. And I just laughed at him. I said, you know, you're making 40000 a year. I pay... I, I paid like nine bucks an hour, which is more than a lot of people paid in those days, a lot more. And he said, I don't care. You know, he, his family had money. 
He said, I don't care. He said, I'm dropping out of the whole scene. The divorce kind of, you know, made him. And so he, he became a big help for me running my pool rooms. So childhood friend and sparring partner became business yep. partner employee. Yep. He was an employee. He, wasn't, he never wanted to go into the business part of it. Okay. But he was a heck of an employee. It's just like Mike Betts, when I got here in Tulsa, uh, was a big help. It, people thought I took care of Mike Betts because I, you know, let him stay at the house and all that. And, you told uh, me he lived in that room for 25 years. Yeah, at least. And he said he said he was more of a brother. Yeah. Or uh, Michelle's uncle. Yeah, I've been blessed. I've had uh, about four friends that uh, really were like brothers to me. Earl Schrock was one of them. Mike Betts, Sam Schoenhorst, who was my first running buddy and best friend for ages. And, and of course, they're, they're gone now. But uh, uh, Sam, uh, Sam and I have been all over the country together playing pool. And you wanted to know the, the first pool room I opened was actually a bar in my, in my hometown. Called, my brother being a musician and me being a pool player. It was Older brother? Younger brother. Younger brother. What what instrument? He played guitar. Well, he, he played about everything, I, except horn. But you know, he, he played anything with strings on it and and piano. Matter so, of fact, he's one of the first people I saw here in Tulsa that played uh, lead guitar and still had the organ sitting in front of him when he played out at some of the clubs. He was one of the first people I ever saw do that. When we were in college down in Tahlequah, he played with a. A music genius, uh, Randy, oh, what's Randy's last name? Crouch, Randy Crouch, uh -huh. a great musician. Yeah, he's one of the few, there's been, you know, Oklahoma's produced some great musicians. Randy's an unknown. He got invited to play on TV back when you had to be a, a real good player to be on TV. Uh -huh. They wanted him to come in. And, he had a band called The Flying Horse, which is where I think Neil Young got his the okay. name of his band. And uh, he was before Neil a little bit. And uh, they all used to fly into Telequa because that's still well weed they had, that marijuana that they, they grew down there. All them musicians were flying down the there. That's where weed was. And Randy, he was the one that headed the... Uh, Black Fox, I think it was called, when they started to build that nuclear plant here in Tulsa. Okay. Back 40 years ago or maybe more, I don't know, something like that. But he was he's the one that made that album. So what, what exactly, I understand he played music and you obviously, I guess, wanted to start a, a pool hall or a bar. Yeah. That was your, you wanted to start a pool room. Oh, I, bar. Wanted, I wanted to get into the business. And, this and the first, first person, uh, first time I... Uh, my brother and I talked about it. I went to this lady. There's a lady in Pahuska, George Barrett, that ran the best clubs I'd ever seen. Okay. Uh, she did it. She knew how to do everything right. Well, it, was, it, she, it, it amazed me. Some there's times when you go to somewhere just because you see everything done right, you know. Mm -hmm. And she uh, uh, and I were talking one day, and I said, you know, my brother and I are going to open a club. And I said, no, we're, we're not going to open one here because of you, you know, in Osage County. And she said, well, why don't you buy my club? And I just laughed and said, you know, I'm not going to have you as a competitor. I know you'll open another one up. And she said, no, I'm not going to open another one up. She said, I'm through. She was getting older. She was probably in her early 60s. Uh -huh. And uh, when she said that, I said, well, Georgia, you just sold your club. And that was the first club we opened. I called it the Bank Shop. The bank shop. I got it right out of uh, the book of uh, by Minnesota Fats. Okay. Rudolph Ronald Wrong. He, I, um, uh, I think I put on the front window of the bank shop and down below, just like he did, other great robberies. <laughs> and uh, we did pretty well there. The, all, all the beer companies thought we were doing real well. well what type of people came in there? Well, it's a kind of funny deal. I had a bar. It was kind of, you know, it's, it's in Osage County, and I had a, a lot of Indian friends. And it was it wasn't what you call an Indian bar. It was an open bar, but there was a lot of Indians come in, 
that uh, were really good friends of mine. And then <clears throat> they started something after about two years of my running it. They started something uh, with the motorcycles outside of town. A guy named Nelson Carter opened a thing up where all uh, bike meet. And I remember the first year that they did that, they had 100 bikes plus lined up Kaiheka Avenue and right down Main Street in front of the, uh, right in front of the police station. Uh -huh. And I don't think anything about it. Our place is full, overpacked. We're right next to some steps that had an underneath deal. And all the guys are out there drinking too and everything. And um, I got a, one of the police officers come down and said, man, they're freaking out. I said, this, he said, the chief of police is calling the National Guard, the Highway Patrol. And I said, man, just tell them. I'm going to tell you exactly how it's going to happen. At 1 o'clock, everybody's going to get on their bikes. They're going to single file out of town, out to this bike meet, about three miles out of town. And uh, <laughs> it happened just the way I said it would. And from then on, the, the town loved having the bikers. But that first... They didn't know what was going on. First one, it was scary. Yeah. Probably scary, right? Yep. A bunch of Native Americans on bikes, a hundred of them? No, this is another... It, it turned... It was both a Native American and... Okay. And a biker bar. All right. Can you... That mixture. Yeah. And, and never any trouble. As a matter of fact, when I bought the place, Georgia Barrett told me, Jim, your best friend can't, you've got you to bar him. My best friend was Sam Seanhorse, the toughest man in Osage County. Toughest. The toughest. And Osage County is the biggest county in Oklahoma. <laughs> so, okay, so we're talking about all of Tulsa. Uh, or Osage County. Osage, just north of Tulsa, yeah. Okay. It's a, uh, and, so and he's a tough guy. But you got a bar. Toughest human being I ever met. And I had to go to tell Sam, I had to tell Sam, Sam, you can't come in. And he said, Jim, I've never started a fight in my life. And I said, yeah, but you're in one every weekend. And that's no exaggeration. Every weekend. He became the bouncer out at the, the club before that was Stafford's. And he was the bouncer out there. And people would come from Oklahoma, from Tulsa, from Ponca City, from Bartlesville, the tough guys would come in. They all wanted that job of being the bouncer because you get girls when you're the bouncer. Huh. Well, nobody ever come close to whipping him. And he, but he did fight every weekend. Wow. And we, we, later, uh, we became road partners. <clears throat> and, the, you know, I met him at the first pool room that I ever went into when I was 13 years old there. It was called Henry Roberts Palace, Henry's Palace. Huh? And uh, I was real lucky. They had a fella in there that used to run with Moscone. He wasn't that good a pool player. He was a set-down player. He had one of those kind of minds. He could remember. He could shut, riffle through a deck of cards and remember the order of the cards. He would. He could play uh, dominoes and remember what. He just knew. He, he had one of those minds for set-down games. So Moscone and those kind of people liked running with a guy like that because they had more ways of making money on the road. I like that you call them sit-down games. I never heard that. But, uh, you know, gin and uh, all, all those games where you're sitting down, pitch. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And uh, Domino's was big back then. So he, and he, he, had, a, he had a standing offer of $1,000. And this is back in the late 50s, early 60s. Anybody come in town and beat him, you know, he'd put up 1000 bucks. play anybody. They brought that guy, Red, from Oklahoma City. It was supposed to be a real good domino player, and, and Leroy Frew ran over him. That's the, the guy I'm talking about, is Leroy Frew. Well, Leroy saw me practicing on that. We grew up, the, the Henry wouldn't let you play on a snooker table at first. You had to get to play pretty good before he'd let you on a snooker table. He had two pool tables in the back, and that's where we had to go. Okay. Well, as soon as I got good enough, and we, we, boy, we wanted to play that snooker table. We moved up to snooker tables. Well, I'm on that first table, and I'm trying to use inside English. I'm trying to shoot the two ball. I don't know if you know how the snooker set up, but I'm shooting from like the five spot. That's in the middle. In the middle. 
at the two, and I'm trying to put inside English so that I come back down this side of the four to shoot the three in instead of going around. Mm -hmm. And I could go around. I could use outside, but I couldn't use inside. I, I, pl I probably hit that shot for 20 minutes, and every time I'd hit just left of the pocket mm -hmm. with inside English, you're getting the deflection. And he sat there, and I think it just got him disgusted. He come up to me and he said, Jim, do this. And I did it. He said, put your hand here, do this, do this. Now do this. Now pull the trigger. I made the ball. The cue ball bit on the end rail and came back just where it's supposed to go. He taught me tuck and roll. Tuck and roll. And uh, most players nowadays, they, they, they know a lot, but... Back in the old days, those little time players, they, they played with tuck and roll. Eddie Taylor, Cowboy Jimmy Moore, all those people played tuck and roll. Now, tuck, can, you, can you be a little more specific, specific about what tuck and roll is? Because I'm thinking it's using inside. It's, yeah, it's a... Uh, I don't know what that means. It's... <sighs> all right, most people, when they play English, mm -hmm. they go down on that side of the ball. If you're... If you're, if they're Pretty good players, they won't move this much. And if they're not too good, you, sometimes they'll move the whole cue, which makes you have a ton of deflection. Okay. If you're hitting, using left-hand English, you're going to fly to the right a full ball over the length of the table. If you do this. If you do this. Now, if you do this, it won't be quite as much. Are you moving the back or the front? But if you, if you mm -hmm. keep your hand, your, your fulcrum hand, mm -hmm. if you keep it on line or even on the other side of the line, just a tad, and, and use backhand English. You, you, but it's like crossing your axis. You got your axis and you cross it. Mm -hmm. if you, uh, people say that's what's happening is now you're getting the deflection. Well, no, what's happening is you're distributing the weight of the cue where it hits the cue ball. So it's throw. It's not throw. It's it's, not that's what people think. They think it's throw. You've distributed the weight yeah, of the, the weight stick. of the the weight of the cue stick still on that fulcrum. Uh huh. And you sh you're going to go right straight down the line. You you, sh I can't use it right now. I grew up doing it, played it for years and years, and I if I'm within two diamonds of the object ball, I can use it. Okay. But uh, if I get any further back, it's something about my grip hand. Um, I'm grabbing or I'm doing something. That kills it. Now, I think what you mean, in my mind, tuck and roll means this would be a tuck for right-handed player. That's right. And tuck this would and be a roll. roll. Correct. And we'll call that backhand English. Okay. Some people call it backhand English. Uh, all my life, we, uh, you know, Eddie Taylor called it this and that. Okay. This and that? Yeah. Literally, literally this <laughs> and that? But he was a genius. He knew it was tuck and roll, but he just had his own way of doing the things. And uh, but so, he all plays with tuck and roll. I tried to get him to teach it when he came into the deal, but, you know, that's a secret not very many people want to talk about. Yeah. If you can it's, do something that other people can't. Well, it's huge. You, you never have to aim in a different spot. You never have to allow for deflection. My daughter can do it better than me now because uh, even though she hasn't played in years, because I just don't, you know, I, I don't know my age. I'm ready to go play pool and do it because I'm one of those people. Well, you, you, there's other things. There's, a, you know, that, that people don't understand when you talk about the rub. And uh, there's two rubs in pool. You got to know that. You got to know about the bump. You got to know what the fat part and the skinny part of the cue ball means. You got to play. Are you currently it. giving pool lessons, Jim? I did it <laughs> because for years. I want to. I want to sign up. I right did it now. for years, but you can't. Um, I, I just don't have energy. Tell me what a bump is in the rub. The bump? It's an imagination okay. point on the cue ball. I always used it in a different way than, than call the bump, but it, the players call it the bump back in them days. I look at it as a pinhead. A pinhead? The head of a safety pin. Uh -huh. uh, not a safety pin, but a, a regular pin. It's a little bitty dot on the ball. Cue ball. And you feel it like on the object ball. On the object ball. And if, it's like if you get a ball that's on a rail, you got to hit the back side, the skinny part of that bump. If you're using outside English, you got to hit the fat part of the bump. 
And in other words, the front part of the bump. It's very small. It's like the head of a pin. Now, now not the sharp end, the, uh, the blunt end of a pin. That's the way I always looked at it. If you take Jack White's deal, his, his idea is if you've got to move the tip over a, a tip, uh -huh. you've got to aim at like you're aiming at a dime on the ball, and you've got to aim at the other side of that. And a dime instead of a contact point. Instead of a, con a contact point. And the bump. And Jack played real well. The bump is the 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 contact point. It's the contact point. And so you have to learn how to play the bump, and move the bump. When you you got to know when to use it. If if it's froze to the rail, it's very really important that you use the back side of it. You mean a rail fur. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it's not really a rail first. It's almost what you call a contact, but you do end up hitting the rail just a barely first. You're talking about compressing the rail. You're compressing the rail. See, back when I was playing, half the time, no, 90% of the time, you're playing with a big cue ball. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you run a ball down the rail with a big cue ball? Mike Betts and I would go on the road together. Mike was a big table player mm -hmm. and played with a little ball because here in Tulsa, Fat Randy was probably the best bar table player in the country with a little ball. Okay. And he'd go into a bar where they had a big ball. If it was any kind of action at all, he'd steal that big ball and put a little ball there. He'd throw that little big ball down the street. <laughs> well, Mike Best was uh, the same way. He played that little ball a lot better than he did the big ball. And we, I take him to a tournament there, and, you know, Matt Locke's there, a lot of people are there, and Mike Betts wins a tournament. Never ran a ball down the rail. He banked every one of them in. He had to play for the bank because he couldn't run a ball down the rail with a big ball. you got to hit the rail way first. got to aim that part of the cue ball at the back side of the bump. The back side of the bump, that makes and sense. In other words, that... That ball, big ball's got to sink into that rail quite a way. Yeah. Now, I played it great. I, that's I, you know, that was the main ball I played with. Yeah. yeah that was my favorite tall, really, back then. Well, uh, as a comparison, we're talking about uh, David Matlock, um, who was called the best bar table player, but it was also with the big ball. Well, he, like played the, he played either ball great. Either ball, great. Either ball. Yeah, I, I had bet on him betting. Uh, he could play any living human. He got beat twice, and I, I told the story of Mary Keniston, uh, of what happened to him. Mary was happened to be there. It was, right, it was here in Oklahoma, and Mary happened to see that. And she asked me about that. About David getting beat? Yeah. And uh, David had been jarred. Um, I'm sitting there with Danny Dysart. Do you know who Danny is? Of course, Danny, Danny and Evelyn. I'm sitting there with Danny Dicer. We're like the table's right in front of us, and we're at one of those longer tables there. Uh, and I'm looking, she's back of the room. And Will Willingham, who is a big time bookie back in Vegas, was with Verl Horn, who had a, Verl was very wealthy, uh -huh. and several other people, Bill Dugan and all that. And they got David down there, and they're going to play Larry Hubbard. And Larry and him are, are matched up. And Junior Weldon's there, and he's with David. They're staying in the same motel. And, I, and Junior Weldon um, and David are sitting together over here. The table's here. They're sitting at a, bar, uh, at a booth right here. Uh huh. We're right beside the table in a long table. And I'm, I'm sitting there, and the, it, was, it was the first or second game, I saw David line up toward me. And he shot a shot, and he made it. But I turned to uh, Danny Dysart, and I said, well, this game's over. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, they jarred David. And he, he said he couldn't believe it. He said, what's the deal? I said, well, look at Dave. Dave's drinks over there by itself now. Junior Weldon moved. The thing is, all the money was there bet on David. I mean, when Larry Hubbard came, he had a backer, and he had his own money. He, he, was, he bet on himself quite a bit. Larry did. He was one of those guys. And uh, now Larry had nothing to do with it. I swear to God that I do not believe that Larry had anything to do right. with it. But Junior Weldon sitting there with him, 
They're with all these money men. And all these people are betting on David. So Junior Weldon gets up. He goes on IT. He's talking to uh, Verl Horn. And uh -huh. Verl and him, I think, got together and put some scopolamine in David's drink. And uh, now this is not enough to like kill somebody. I mean, I guess it could be fatal, but this is something that like just would throw someone's game off. Yeah, it's like a heart medicine. It's a, your timing is off. So it makes you like less coordinated. Uh, yeah, you're, uh, they did it to uh, Mike Massey out in Vegas and put him in the hospital. I mean, he, he put himself in the hospital. He won 40000 on the gaming tables, and he's standing at the front after they jarred him, giving money away to the pool players that walk in. He went, he went off the air a little bit. And the next time I saw Mike, he came, it was, it was years later, probably six or seven years later, I had the pool hall open here in Tulsa. And uh, Mike came in and said, Jim, I'll give, put an exhibition on if you let me preach. Mike did? Yeah. Uh, he got into Jesus a yep. lot, you know, and I, I said, Mike, I'll pay you to put an exhibition on. I, I love the way Mike plays, and I think he was one of the best exhibition shooters uh -huh. ever. And I really liked Mike. Uh -huh. And um, so he, he did put an exhibition on and everything, but he wanted to preach. <laughs> I said, not in my pool room. <laughs> not in the pool room. And, uh, but anyway, I, I think I got away from... Uh, uh, the first story about well I brought uh, up Matlock and then you wanted to tell me about the two yeah. times he got beat and then he was well, he, jarred yeah, that, that's the reason he was beat is he was jarred and I explained it to Danny now they're betting the other way Junior Weldon and them are betting the wrong way you know they're with Danny I mean David but betting against them but, but because all that money there's so much money there and uh, you know they can win 20,000 or the, the 20,000 was in the middle and there was 5,000 that they bet on the side automatically right away. But they ended up winning a lot more than that. I remember Mary said she tried, was betting with a so well-dressed group that was sitting beside her. She said she wanted to bet with them. So she turned and said, you want to bet 40? To you? And, uh, no, to them. No, to them, yeah. And they said, uh, for, for, uh, uh, I forget what it was. I've got it written down because she texted me about it. Uh -huh. But anyway, she thought they thought she meant like twenty thousand or forty thousand or something like that. No, forty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Mary wanted to sweat that. Yeah. Uh, well, that there was a lot of money in that house at that time. And you know? this, is, this is quite a few years ago. But that's the reason David got beat in that deal. And he got beat one other time. And the same thing, I believe, happened because it was the same deal, kind of deal. He got beat by, uh, I think, two people. <sighs> one guy was breaking for another guy. C.J. Wiley might have been the guy that was shooting. Okay. But I can't remember for sure. They used to do that, by the way, uh, uh, matching up. Like where you had a designated breaker. One of the greatest breakers was uh, Billy Johnson, Wade Cranes. Yeah, okay. They called himself, but it was Billy Johnson. And Wade Crane, greatest. No, player. it was Wade Crane was his real name. He called himself Billy Johnson. Um, I might ask you some more questions about the break. I got to kind of um, put us on track here. Uh, hmm. Let's talk about you college and pool. You went to college? You played pool? Where'd you go to college at? I went to college at uh, Tahlequah. It took me five and a half years to get a four-year degree because I was on the road playing pool a lot and took time off. And then I went to uh, spent uh, two years at uh, OSU. Okay. And so I got seven and a half years of college. And what, what was your uh, focus? What was your major? Well, I majored in sociology and psychology. But I did a lot of studying in philosophy. Um, I'm still crazy about that. Those, you know, I, I do a paper. That's one of the things I do in life right now. Is has a lot to do with kind of a religious thing deal. I'm I'm not a religious guy as far as you know the God of Abraham and all that. But I studied it. I loved it. Uh huh. But uh, uh, while we were there, I went to school with Sam Schonhorst. He was in college with me. 
Sean Horse? The guy, the guy that uh, I said was the toughest guy around. Okay. That uh, I met him there in, in Pahuska. Uh, he hung out in the same pool room when he got out of the, uh, when we both got out of the service. Okay. We were both in the same pool room. And uh, the best player around at that point in that area was Donnie Folks. Donnie Folks. Donnie Folks. And I ran with him the first year that I got out of the service. He oh, could beat me at that time. Can, can you tell us what branch of the service and what, what you were in? Oh, I was in the Army for Army National Guard for two and a half years, and then I went in the Navy for two years. Thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your service. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I found out then that was the best thing that happened out of that whole deal. I got the GI Bill to go to college. Mm -hmm. But the best thing I found out, I can't work for the other guy. I just can't do it. Um, <laughs> uh, I realized that I needed to do something on my own. So it's a good thing I picked pool for her. I'm, I'm, it sounds like me. Once I got out of the Army, I've never had a job where I worked for someone else. I'm good. Not. And uh, I think that is the best way to describe it. I've tried to explain it to people, but I just. Yeah. So you're in the yeah. Army. Did you go anywhere, do anything? Oh, well, I made two tours to Vietnam. Wow. And uh, uh, it was, it was a, quite an experience. I got to see an awful lot in two years. It was the best move I made if I'm going to go into service. I mean, I got to go to the Great Lakes for indoctrination, didn't have to go through basic. It was a prior service. And then I stationed in San Diego first, and then L.A., Alameda. And then uh, got to go uh, to, uh, uh, immediately we went to Vietnam, Tonkin Gulf. I was on the USS Coral Sea. That's, that's a ship up there. USS Coral Sea. Cool. You need uh, some water? You need some water here. You want some? Yeah, yeah, it won't hurt. Um, so you're, you're in the Army. You're on a ship. What's your, what's your MOS? What's your job? In the, in the, in the Navy. Oh, in the Navy. You're in the Army National Guard, then Navy. Yeah, and uh, in the Army, I was uh, at Howitzers. We worked with 105s and 155s. Okay. In the Navy, I was on the flight deck all the time. Flight deck? Yeah, I was, uh, <clears throat> what it amounts to is, uh, well, you call us blue shirts. You had red shirts, purple shirts, red uh, uh, and blue shirts. Purple sh shirts kept the planes in the and uh, fueled uh, the red shirts, handled the munitions. Okay. And as blue shirts, we uh, chalk and tied planes. And I went AWOL every, every time we was in Hawaii or Hong Kong. <laughs> and uh, so I stayed on the flight deck as a blue shirt. A lot of people went, to, uh, you know, at, at the end as long as I was. Got a better deal than running around chalking and tying planes. When you say chalking and tying planes, plane lands, it's got to stay still so it doesn't fall off the ship. So you've, what is, chalking's put the thing under put the wheels. Put chalk and, and, and tying. And you've got these heavy chains and, and these things are about that big around where you've got to screw them down. Uh -huh. Wouldn't nobody could out arm wrestle me for several years after I got out. <laughs> From doing this? Oh man, two years of, you know. And, um, uh, I had I had to stay there for two years because. Now, were you single when you were in the military? Yes. Okay, tell me about Hawaii. Were you sneaking off in the, the islands? Well, <laughs> it's been for three months. And uh, uh, the first tour I did was uh, six months, and the second one was nine months. And um, you know, you you get to go to port once in a while, but once in a while, I mean you. Try to find a girlfriend or whatever you can, you know. Right. So, I, I, uh, I, you know, you had to be a lieutenant or above to stay off the ship after midnight. Okay. Which uh, you weren't. I, I stayed off the ship every time. <laughs> First three or four times, they didn't catch me because I had the guys I worked with were friends of mine, really close. As a matter of fact, I got pictures of them up there Richard Escobedo and Jesse Grimes and those guys. Uh, they would. They would call my name, and one of them would go here, and <laughs> got it. They didn't catch me, but they finally got me. And uh, I, I went to E three. They busted me back. 
I went in as an E2 because of prior service and come out as an E2. Okay. <laughs> so. um, I'm not going to bring up me getting in trouble in the military, but uh, I, I definitely understand. You know, when, you, when, you go, when you're going to war, you're probably a good soldier uh, overseas, but in garrison, I was, I was not a good, you know, if on a deployment, you can do your job, but maybe when we're back home or off, off the ship is where, where everybody got in trouble and messed yeah. up. Well, it's like one of the things that helped me out when I first went in the Army, my next door neighbor's name was Bill Rogers. And uh, he was a boxer. He yeah. trained all the time in the backyard and all that. And he was the best guy I ever saw throwing a knife and then drawing and shoot okay. a gun. When he first went in the Army, after basic, they put him on special forces. He went around Europe doing exhibitions with the pistol, you know, drawing and putting the cup on his hand, drawing to shoot the cup, and all that kind of stuff. You know, he was just really talented guy when it comes to the cup. And then shoot the cup. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And uh, he got out and showed up at my, about two weeks before I was going in service in the Army the first time for my basic training. He stopped by the house and uh, he wasn't supposed to get out for another four or five months. And he said, I asked him, what the hell? And he said uh, that he, they, he was a, a boxing champion and did a tour with that and a tour was showing the, the pistol thing and then they put him in a regular deal. He went out and got drunk and ended up whipping a couple of uh, MPs and they gave him a dishonorable discharge. No, it wasn't dishonorable. It was undesirable. Uh -huh. And uh, I thought about that. You know, uh, this guy, if you want anybody in the next fox hill, hole with you, mm -hmm. that's the guy I want. Guy was a great shot. You know, he was he had more nerve than most people. Uh -huh. And uh, so when I went in the Army and the, I got this little sergeant yelling out, better ride home and tell your mom to sell the shit house because your ass is mine. I just busted out laughing. <laughs> uh-oh. Yeah, uh-oh. So, but that's the way it went. Oh, that's why I couldn't, you know, I just, I can't work for the other guy. Right. And pool was just the, Id the ideal thing. And I ran with a, get back to the pool bar, I ran with Donnie Fulks for the first nine months. He could beat me. Because, uh, you know, in, in the service, I never got to hit, any, hit a ball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, after about seven or eight months, I figured out this guy, I can't trust him. And so I, uh, I quit running with him and uh, finally ended up beating him about nine months after I got out of the service. But he was all around one of the greatest players in, in Oklahoma. Uh, if you talk about snooker and nine ball and eight ball, he, he was a great snooker player. And uh, I think he could have beat Fat Randy with a big ball. Now, nobody could beat Fat Randy with that little ball. It was, he, I watched Fat Randy play that little ball. He, he claims he's, and I, I don't have any reason to doubt him. He claims he's, he ran thir uh, 28 racks. Man, that's, you know, something I'd never, never heard of. Back in them days. Uh, uh, if he'd have said 18, I'd just be surprised. But 28's amazing. 28 racks. And, you know, I, I really, I believe he could. Uh, during his during his heyday, he was the well, a cute little story. I think it's cute. He was. I never seen Fat Randy. How fat was Fat Randy? Well, that's his picture right there. Okay, we'll get it. And uh, yeah, it's kind of turned this way. He's sitting there with a the girl. I think I got a couple of them. That's Donnie Folks up there in the second shelf down at the very front in the white shirt. Okay. That's Donnie. All right. Uh, but. Uh, so you didn't trust him, but you but, but you stopped running with him. But nine months later, you could beat him, and you're talking. Well, not nine months after I got out, it was it was nine months after I got out of the service. I ran with him almost nine months, and then uh, uh, I quit running with him, and I beat him when I did. 
I was able to beat him. And uh, uh, I, I when, want, that's when I started running with Sam Schoenhorst. I, I want to, so, so most people that are my age for sure, um, or anywhere close to my age, know you from being the, fam the famous pool room owner. Mm -hmm. I mean, things were done what you call right. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to, I want to just before we go into that, I want to, I want to talk about you playing. What were your aspirations? What, what did you want? I know you loved <laughs> pool, but I was more than just playing pool. You're a competitor. Well, that was my job then. I, I, I looked at it as a job and. I never felt like I went to work a day in my life after I got out of service. And even when I owned the pool room, I, did, I, I loved pool room so much, owning it. And I spent 17, 18 hours a lot down there, sometimes 21 at the pool room. You know, I, I love being there. And even playing some uh, sit down games. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite sit down game? Uh, to me, it's uh, probably gin. Jim. I love to play dominoes, but there's no domino players left. You can't find a game, but uh, gin's probably my favorite. I remember seeing you play gin in Billiard Palace. You'd have a gin room there, mm -hmm. card room, and it was right behind the nine-foot tables. And my dad, uh, you know, if I was lucky once a month or, or at the most, he'd take me up to Tulsa for the weekend and get a hotel and I'd get to play with the players from Tulsa. Mm -hmm. I'm from Oklahoma City. But I remember, he said, you see that guy back there, right? I'm just kidding. He said, that's Jim McDermott. He owns this pool room. And then he goes, I go, wow, that's cool, you know? And he's like, all this, it's my favorite pool room. And you see this guy over here and he's pointing at like a, a champion pool player that doesn't have $2 to put together or own anything. He says, these are two exact opposites. So if you want to be in pool, you want to follow Jim McDermott's path and be in the business of pool. And, this, and he was explaining that, that uh, there's more than one way to make money in pool. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, in my heyday, you could make a lot of money playing on the road. All right. So you I ran, When I ran with Ron, Ronnie Phoebus for one year there, I took 85000 home. Wow. Ronnie and I both made 85000 Wow. And that was in the late 70s. That was a lot of money for that time. So you can't, there, back when there was action. 85000 you could buy a real nice house. Yeah. A real nice house. Like a. It was a lot of money back in them days. And uh, uh, I, I, I think that a guy can make a real good living just doing that. But. I wanted that you got to travel. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't sit still. And I, I kind of missed the home life a little bit, you know. Family stuff? Yeah. And so that's kind of one reason I went into the pool room business. Um, well, you weren't on the road, but you sure brought them to where you were. Eventually, yeah. the billion well, dollars. I spent, I spent 11 years on the road. That's longer than most people spent running the road. You know, uh, people don't, uh, the guys that ran with me said, you should be the guy and they call the ghost because nobody knew how good I played. And, uh, well, you I can tell us car. now, you're not knocking yourself now. No, and, 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 and I don't want to come off as bragging too much. Either, I want though. you to, I, I have got a question here that says, what was your highest skill level? And, you know, put, put it in, in reference for us. Uh, I felt like I could play pool with any living human on a bar box with a big ball or a little ball. Now, a big table, I was never that good a big table player. Only <clears throat> I played straight pool on the big table because of uh, the ACUI during when I was in college. Uh -huh. and during that period, uh, Utley would come up and uh, he'd bring people up. He brought, uh, once he brought uh, Birdman. I can't, I don't remember his other, other name. He's from Dallas, good player. Mm -hmm. He brought him up, and I busted. Uh, that's kind of a funny story. I, I, I beat Birdman on on uh, on a gold crown, and um, I, I was think I was about uh, 
2800 or something like that ahead and he quit and UJ said he'd play me some if I give him the eight. UJ. UJ. Utley Puckett. UJ Puckett. Mm -hmm. That's how I know his name. He said if you give him the eight, he plays. Yeah. So I gave him the eight and I'm playing big table real good then because I've been practicing for the ACUI tournaments. So I don't get to see him shoot and I'm 4,000 winner. And um, you were just ran them all. Yeah, I was running out real good. Playing straight pool or nine ball? This was playing nine ball. Okay. And that, uh, I never, I never liked straight pool. I played it for the okay. ACI only. You are playing and, nine ball? Then. And so I'm playing nine ball, and I, uh, Utley said uh, he's going to he quit me, <laughs> and he said, uh, "You give me the six ball, and I'll play some more." And I'm with Sam Shawnhorst. And I, I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And he had these baggy pants on. I don't know if you know UJ's style, but he had this fishing hat on. With the ear things that were up above like this. Uh -huh. Fishing hooks you know, you know, stuck in his hat and okay. all that. Boots open, untied, where the boots were flared out, tucked in. Partially tucked in pants, uh -huh. big old baggy pants. He reached into his pocket, and pulled out a wad of bills. I don't know if it was Oklahoma wad, but on okay, the outside oh there, there was a hundred dollar bill on the outside. So I figure he's carrying a few thousand. But you know, even if it's just tens and twenties, or you know, that's all. I, I could see there's some money. He said, "You give me the six, you can win all this." Uh huh. So. I walk over to Sam and I said, what do you think, Sam? I said, do you want a shot? Take a shot at it? He said, well, that's a lot of money. We've got to shoot at it. So I went over and I gave him the six. And uh, I won two games, two more games. And, uh, and then he beat me like, I don't know, six or seven in a row. Uh -huh. And I got to see his speed. You know, he kind of saw, I knew that this, he's with this albino. Uh -huh. You know, uh, Birdman's an albino. Okay. And they look like they're from the backwoods the way he's got it all, all, all dressed up. So I, we don't know what we're getting into. So uh, when I saw that, I said, no, we've got to, we're going to play even if we're going to play anymore. Wow. And he said, no, he said he wouldn't play me. But he went back home, went back down to Dallas because one of the Dallas boys came up a few, about a month or so later and told us. Utley said he got some boy up and Telequad giving him, give him the six, made a big joke out of it. <laughs> I said, yeah, but did he tell you I was like 3,200 still winner? <laughs> he left that part out. Uh. Utley, he was quite a character. He okay. ran with that Joey Torma that one time, and I really, I, I liked Utley. He, he and I did a couple of things together. But um, he bought that Joey Torma up once, and we were all together. It was me and him and Joey together. We're playing this kid from, I think he's from Florida, named Tommy Hill. You may have heard of him. He went down to Dallas and became a dealer at one of the deals. But Tommy played real good big table pool. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tommy won the first set. And Joey Torma, who's a sorry, a no good son of a gun, uh, asked him to double the bet. And he wouldn't bet double the bet. He said, I'll play you some more, same bet. I think they were playing 500 or a set or something. And I was in on the action and uh, on the losing end. And then Joey started talking about whipping this Tommy Hill. Tommy's a nice guy. He's about 6'2 and skinny. You know, he can't whip a, a tush hog like Tommy. Uh, like Joey Torma. So uh, I had to step in and I told Utley, I said, I'm not going to, you know, I'm, we're not going to do this. This is not going to happen. The same guy, Joey Torma, went to a friend of mine in Enid, Oklahoma, Clarence Burroughs, and said he had a game at this uh, bar called the Blue Something. And, uh, but he didn't have any money and he didn't have a pool cue. 
Well, Clarence is real good for pool, and he's just one of the greatest guys. He's real tough. He, he was a cement worker, and he owned the cement deal. Huh. And uh, he gave Joey $3,000 and a Zambodi pool cue to go down and play this guy with. He went down about an hour later, and there was never a game, nothing. Joey just took the money and the pool cue and left town. That's what kind of rat fink he is. <clears throat> Clarence said, just tell him, if anybody can tell me where he's at, I'll give him $5,000. Even if I knew, I probably wouldn't have told him because I didn't want to get going to prison or something. You know? right. I, I, like, I traveled some with him, too. He, he and I went down to Texas and did some. It sounds like you had to be not just a good pool player and a good game maker, but you had to be kind of tough or wild. No, I know a lot of people that weren't. Really? Yeah. They just have a running buddy that was? You, you take guys like um, John Shupik. You know who John Shupik is? Yeah, he's he's uh, from um, Oregon, I believe. Yeah. And John's a nice guy. Uh, he did get robbed once. They tried to rob me a couple of times, and that's why the reason I've been in a couple of gunfights. Um, but they they robbed him, and uh, uh, I know a lot of people that weren't that tough that traveled the road and didn't have any trouble. I I very seldom had trouble. Like I say, I was out there eleven years, and I might have had three incidences. Most of your fights were over when you're playing for a beer or, or over the quarter on the side of the table. Or some girl. Well, that, be, Birds, that yeah. has nothing to do with pool. Though. Well, it's like... Well, Anybody can do that. Anybody. A bird, bird hits your door? Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. Well, I've got college. We've talked about the bar. I think we might as well get into... Billiard Palace and Magoo's. I don't know which one opened first. First, there was the first Billiard Palace. We, there was two of them. Okay. We opened the first one down on 13th and Harvard. And that's where there was a lot of action. 24-hour room. 24-hour room. And if you came into town, you were guaranteed to immediately play. Any road player come into town, he got to play $200 sets right off the bat if he couldn't play for more. And that's from the beginning. From the very get-go. I'd come down, or Mike Betts would come down, and we'd gamble with them. And you set it up that way on purpose, right? Sure. Yeah, I want them to come down, yeah. And um, Some of them didn't leave. Oh, most of them didn't leave. <laughs> I mean, we had all kinds of them live here, stay here for ages. I'll know? bet there's not another town the size of Oklahoma or, or Tulsa. of Tulsa that... Uh, has had more pool players move to it in one decade. Yeah. I mean, you could probably well, write me a list of pool players that moved to Tulsa because I've, I've, of Billiard Palace. I've got a pretty good list right here. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, Dick Lane uh, stayed around an awful lot. Dick was like a real close friend of ours. He, his, his folks were from Pahuska. His family lived up there. His grandmother... His name, Bay Bell Kennedy Highway between Ponca City and Pasca. Okay. And uh, Dick's uh, spent a lot of time here. There's a lot of pictures of Dick over there. And he was the best, to me, if, uh, he was probably the best uh, straight pool player. He ran more 200s than anybody. I heard he'd run over 150 like every week or over 100 every over, week. He ran, he ran 200 before he quit. Before, yeah, something like that. Yeah. How do you like to play a guy like that? I mean, he was just... Was and he that, played good nine ball and eight ball. Was he just it, that it, focused or what? What was it? Oh, you know, he liked that game a lot because he's more like the guy that wants to play the basketball player that's great at layups. He likes the deal of uh, thinking about the odds on a shot. You know, it's just... He, he had a, he's phenomenally, his mind works really well on stuff like that. He, he, he puts things together good. So you get to watch and learn from all these guys. Oh, yeah. For, uh, first time I took him anywhere 
we went to play a guy that became a real good friend of mine, real close. As a matter of fact, he put me in the bar box with any living human. He let me play any living human. And, uh, of course, I never had backers. I always bet my own, but I had partners. Uh -huh. And Phoebus was one of them. But I took, Day I took uh, Dick Lane and Donnie Fox and Sam Shawhorse, the three of us, the four of us, we went together. And uh, we went up and we was playing these. We went stopped in Miami, Oklahoma. And uh, that's where Ronnie Phoebus was from. His dad owned a bar there. And there were several people in there that would gamble. And so I introduced Dick Lane as Donnie Folks. Okay. And uh, they're, they're, they're playing, and Ronnie's losing naturally. And some big cowboy walks up to us. Now, I'm not worried about how big a guy is because I got Sam Sean Horse here. You know, he, he whip everybody in the bar. For fun. Yeah. Well, he could, he, he could do it. He wouldn't do it for fun, but he could do it. And uh, the big cowboy walks up and says, now, who would you say that guy was? He knew Dick. Oh. So I said, well, I said, Dick Lane. And uh, Ronnie got mad. Phoebus got mad. He said, well, where's this damn Donnie Folks? And I said, well, he's sitting over there. <laughs> so he, so Donnie gets up and beats him. <laughs> <laughs> and then Sam gets up and beats him. <laughs> and I'd already beaten Ronnie down at Talk while Ronnie came down. <laughs> so after, Ronnie, you, were Ronnie was after hot you were done beating him, you'd just bring him. <laughs> well, group. he came down to Talk and he wanted me to bring people up there. Ronnie, Ronnie, in my book, I had a book. Right. I might have had the best book there was. I loaned it to a guy who his wife threw it away. But I had a book of the best names and the best spots in the country. And uh, tell me what like a line of that a line in the book would say. Would it say like so and so gets the seven from from I, I, what would it be like? I, I would usually just put stars down. Ronnie was a five star general. Okay, so you're writing them by stars. Yeah, I, I, in your book. I, I, he, uh, now that man, he was a sucker. <laughs> okay. okay, five, star. five, five the stars. The more stars, the, five, more, the bigger sucker. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, what had happened to Ronnie? Oh. He went to uh, Vegas and worked out there for two years. And he went from being a five-star general to being one of the smartest hustlers you ever saw in your life. And he, he'd give everybody the chance to gamble. If you're walking down the street with Ronnie and he's walking by some guy, he said, he'll, he'll turn to the guy and say, what do you do for a buck or two? heard that one that's probably where it came from he would just he wanted to gamble and if he if we were going to stop in a town and get gas it had to be some gas station that was kind of privately owned and he would want to say uh flip a coin for the, the gas no and now the guy's wait, taking away the best of it because he's got half the money in the gas or you know something like that he's made, he's made so it, he's, he's more than doubling his money and so a lot of times he'd get the guy started gambling and you once he got him started gambling, he'd keep him gambling. He was real, real smart about all that. He, Ronnie was, and he, he was uh, the second best coin flipper, uh, coin tosser I'd ever seen. Uh, the about best was Gary Bright. You, you know, you, you're from Oklahoma City. You know Gary Bright? Did you ever heard of him? Heard, heard of the story. Gary we're Bright. talking about pitching quarters or flipping heads or tails? No, uh, uh, flipping heads or tails is uh, luck unless you're somebody like. Uh, who was it that made, uh, I beat him out of a lot of money playing one pocket. Uh, the guy that does the diamond tables. Um, Greg? Greg Sullivan. Yeah, Greg Sullivan. Greg Sullivan was a jeweler. All right. That's a story there. Okay, so we're talking about pitching quarters to the spot. Yep. Yeah. What's the biggest? Gary, Gary Bright could take 15 foot away. Okay. 12 to 15. You take a quart jar, pitch 10 coins at it, and make at least three, three of them hit inside that quart jar. Now, you're cutting a lip when he was in stroke. You're talking about, so, so like six, six feet past the edge of the table. Now, the best bet, the, the, the bet that everybody did, nobody would do the thing in the jar because who can do that? You know, I, I could sit there and throw at that jar for an hour and never make one in it. Uh-huh. 
You know, Gary was just phenomenal with that. Um, the, the thing that I, I, I did practice a little bit because there was some gamble going on with it. I remember Surfer Rod did it. He was supposed to be real good at it. You get back about five or six foot from the pool table and flip it and toss at the spot on the pool table. Uh-huh. And the closest one would win, and they, they bet pretty high on it. I remember Surfer Rod's at uh, in Bristol, Oklahoma, TJ's place. And uh, we just won, won a lot of money playing pool. And uh, Rod wants to uh, bet money on lagging at the at spot. Pitching so we, the spot. we get together and call Gary Bright. Gary, and Gary Bright Gary, from OKC. Gary Bright. Gary we Bright. got a guy for you. And uh, Gary comes up. And <clears throat> did, it turned out that John Shupik and uh, Rod Curry, Surfer Rod, were together. And Gary walks in and Rod goes in the other room. This is an eating place. But he's had three pool tables, two in one room and one in another. Rod goes in the other room and he pulls out five quarters, uh, 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 Gary does, and pitches at the spot just to practice uh -huh. while, while Rod's gone. And Shippy jumped up, ran into the other room to where Rod was and said, you know, they were all within that. <laughs> he gave him the line. He gave him the line right there. So the game was off, you he know. He cleared the game. Yeah. But Gary could pitch on anything. Tile, aluminum, uh, tile, uh, carpet, uh, anything. Gary Bright. Buddy Hall said that's a better bet than betting on him playing nine ball. Okay, so these are gambling stories. Give me a, a gambling story of, of Billiard Palace. Um, where, you know, like, uh, it could be the, not necessarily the most money, but maybe the best players or the most biggest crowd or. Well, the old palace was where the real action was there. Um, there would be a, a $500 set here and a thousand dollars set here and there'd be nobody paying attention to it because there's a $5,000 set over here. You had Brownie from Punka City. You had Larry Mayo from Kansas City. Um, what, Donnie Brown? Brownie. Brownie. No, Brownie's from Ponca City. Oh, of course, Donnie hung out there a lot because of uh, Danny Dicer, but Brownie lived there. Okay. Brownie was a backer. We had a backers tournament one time, Bill Dugan. You know, it was, they were, you were proud to be a backer then. It was more like it was part of it. Yeah, you were involved, yeah. It was a gamble. A backers tournament. Yeah. I forget who won it. I, I, I think it was uh, Bill Dugan might have won it. But, you know, we had Bill, Bill and Verl Horn. you never seen people sweat like you've seen them backers sweat trying to win that backers tournament. I mean, it was, it was kind of funny. <laughs> I love it. It's like uh, when you have a league tournament and you have, like, the captain's mm -hmm. tournament of the league. Let's have a backers tournament for all the action. I remember when we was on the way to Amarillo and we listened to that story about Amarillo Slim. And uh, they said some story about him playing at the Billiard Palace. I don't remember the story. Everybody's got a story about the Billiard Palace. Um, I mean, really. Mm -hmm. I've got plenty, uh, especially, I mean, I was young, this is 20 years ago. But, I mean, I probably learned almost everything about pool from the Billiard Palace. <laughs> Watching Brian Jones. Um, who else? Um, and all that was later. Yeah, this is after. There was not a time that I, there wasn't a time where I didn't walk into the bigger palace and that slicker table was full of golf players. I mean, every every time I went in there, it was usually, usually the mountains playing. It was a, okay, so when you say the old palace, I've probably only ever seen what you call the, the new palace. The new palace. One on 21st down here. Tulsa Billion Palace is mm -hmm. the official name. Yeah. Uh, let me see here. That's the logo that we made up for the old palace. Yep. I've seen more shirts with this on it. <laughs> yep. Uh, you can probably still make those and sell them. Yeah. I mean, it's like Eskimo Joe's for 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We sold a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so, biggest bar table match that you can remember? Old Palace and the Palace. At the Palace? I mean, I've got some great bar table matches, but they were before I owned the Palace. Uh, the Palace, uh, there were so many. Uh, I mean, you had. Let me. Uh, I got to look at the book because it's. Do it. I, hey, Laura. Hi. How's it going? It's going great. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, we're doing an interview. We were, we're pretty far into it, but we could probably go for another like six hours. Yeah. I love uh, J dogs. James James Walden. Okay. He had the dogs. James Walden had some of the good real good matches there. Um Jack Hines. Uh James and Jack both played about the same, both played real good run out pool on both big table and bar table. Uh -huh. And uh, there was a lot of good action between them. But I can t you know, there's Jimmy King. Uh, there's so many. You know, Piona hung out there for a long, long time. Uh, he and I ran together but earlier when he came to Oklahoma. Uh, uh, I beat him. Uh, he, I, I'd steered him around after he came back to, you know, this was before I owned the pool rooms. But when I got owned the pool rooms, he came through again and stopped in. And we st and stayed for quite a while. And I'd send him to different spots. I'd give him spots to go play. And uh, I sent him up to Bartlesville. I remember sending him up there to play Bobby Baldwin and some of those guys in Bartlesville. And he, he'd come back from playing Bobby, and he'd say, Bobby beat me. And he'd say, well, man, I don't, I don't, know, don't understand that because he's not supposed to win. Well, he did it. He went up twice. And I've... I kept telling him, man, you're supposed to beat this guy. So he went up a third time. And this time I followed him. I didn't go in the same car. I didn't want to walk in with him, you know, knock his action. So he's in there playing, and I walk in, and I sit down, and I'm watching a little bit, and then I snapped. David Matlock married Bobby's daughter first. What's and Bobby's last name? Bobby Baldwin. Okay, we're talking about Bobby it's, Baldwin. It's it's the same uh, name as the guy that the the did something in Vegas, uh, the great card player, but it's different, different guy. He uh, married his daughter, and um, he played. Uh, uh, Dave was just getting into three cushion. Okay. He was learning from a guy down here named Jim Whitman. Whitman was great at all those diamond systems. And he was teaching Bobby, and they playing on a they played with the the three cushion balls. And the three cushion ball is about another quarter inch. That's, big. I, that's an exaggeration. It's a bigger ball than the big ball, quite a bit. I'm watching that game, and I'm going, "What?" In the, and I'm watching the action of the balls, and I go. Jesus, that's it. Bobby's used to that big ball, that uh, that three cushion ball, and nobody else is. You know, he put a, he put a three cushion ball on the bar table. Yeah, I guess it. And that's what the right slot. Uh, and that, that's why that's why Dave couldn't win. Wow. Because Bobby was used to it, and Dave. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Did you tell him like, hey, that ball? Oh, I told him later. Yeah, uh, wasn't going to knock it while it was going, but. Um. I never could stand knockers. That's, uh, you know, you got stories like uh, Grady Matthews coming into town, going to give an exhibition. I think I paid him $700 to put on an exhibition. And uh, he was going to, he figured he was going to make that 700 and he was in town during the time we we're having a big tournament. And he's going to win the tournament. One of my monthlies, it wasn't one of the big ones, it wasn't one of the quarterlies. Uh -huh. It was a monthly tournament at the Old Palace. He figured he was going to snap it off. Well, he got beat two and out. <laughs> and he lost most of the 700 back. You know, you can't walk into that pool room and expect to come out of it smelling like a rose all the time. Well, you know, some players came and they stayed there, really. 
Um, oh, yeah. You said you got a, a list there in that, in that book, but I remember seeing motorhomes parked in the back parking lot. Yeah. What's from, your, from, we're talking. Julie Mason and, uh, what, what's his name? 24 hours a day. Uh, wake up, eat all three meals there, or, uh, and uh, play pool 24 7. Yep. Wow. You know, uh, Randy Estes had some good games there, Walden, and uh, Scotty Townsend had some good games there. Scotty hung around a lot. And uh, let's see. I'm, uh, Donnie Folks was action there. Like I say, Donnie played awfully damn good. Boy, he was a good player. And uh, Bobby Baldwin is known for one pocket, is that right? Is that my thinking of someone else? No, Bobby Ballin is he's, an, he's a nine ball player, an eight ball player. He's just a regular, you know, but he's not, you know, he's, he might be in Piona's league, but he's not quite the player that Dave Piona was. And Dave Piona's just a good shortstop, he's a real good shortstop. You know who Dave is, don't you? You ever heard of him? He's from California. You can look him up on, the, uh, on your phone. Just. Okay pool player Dave Piona and uh, I really like Dave you remember him don't you no no okay I want to hear a Mike Betts story yeah. Mike Betts uh-huh well uh, Mike was not what you call a gambling guy uh, he beat Mike Massey he beat uh, Mike Siegel when Mike Siegel came through and uh, him and Buddy would, Matt, he lived, he, Buddy, when he lived here, used to live with Mike. They, they lived together. And when Buddy would come through, they'd practice, and they might practice 8, 12 hours a day down at the Palace or Magoo's, and there wouldn't be two games difference at the end of the day. And Buddy Hall is the greatest. It was just the greatest it was back when, like I say, when they first, when he first, um, uh, right after he got through uh, learning uh, what he learned from Eddie Taylor at Shreveport, we're uh, calling this guys and we're dolls pool room. Skinny buddy, like you said earlier. Yeah, yeah. And once he gained weight, you know, he he uh, when Efren Reyes came in as Caesar Morales, he uh, he beat everybody, but he matched up with Buddy for the money, and Buddy beat him. And uh, then uh, Buddy would ask him to play for four or five years after that. Buddy would go up and say, you want to play a set? So Buddy's walking up to, to Efren for four years after they played. And what? And Efren would say, they'd pat him on the arm, me bet on you, Buddy. Me bet on you. Yep. <laughs> of course, when Buddy got heavy and they, you know, he couldn't keep it up. Although in 91, he was player of the year. Again, uh -huh. and his best years was the early 80s, late 70s, although he played great all the way through. Well, but, the first name you gave me when I asked for some action stories of the palace was James Walden. Yeah. And, um, you know, everyone from their own, everyone in their own states got the, the best player in the world from where I live, right? Um, how many people really thought he was the best on the bar table? Oh, I don't think any of us felt that way. What? David Matlock. Okay. David Matlock. How far off was that? The, the, I'm, I'm going to give you a story here, and you can verify it with David. Okay. He's still alive. He can still tell you what the deal is. And I'm going to tell you both sides of that story. David and I played pool for 12 hours and broke dead even. Played nine ball on the bar table for 12 hours and broke dead even. When, this was when I first started trying to get into the into running the bar. And I was still playing good. And uh, it was, I beat Jerry, I beat C.J. Wiley out of the money up at Ponca City at Danny's place. So, uh, so I, you know, I, I played, uh, that was my life. Uh, and, uh, uh, you weren't scared of anybody. You no, know, but David Matlock later, and I don't know, this is probably three and a half, four years later, after I had my club. The first year, I still played good. I remember uh, Jack Schertz bought Junior Brown. 
And Junior Brown, he, he, uh, he, uh, he's written up in a book that uh, when his backer wrote a book. I can't remember the name of the book, but I've got it. I know Junior. Yeah, Junior played real good bar table pool. He ran with Buddy Hall when he was 19. Did he always have his tip that far away from the dang ball? You know what I'm talking about? He always had his Q-tip to the left of the ball. Okay. It always the same way. He kept everything out of sight so that he could match the balls up better. Nothing got in between the balls. He used tuck and roll because he learned it from Buddy. Well, uh, Junior, uh, when he was written up about, he was uh, in Shreveport. No, not Shreveport. Where was it? New Orleans? He was in New Orleans, I believe. Anyway, this riverboat captain was staking him, and he was beating every living human that came through until Junior got into the drugs just a little bit, too, more than maybe just a little bit. Cocaine. And uh, I think his game started going down there a little bit. But this guy came, finally, he beat everybody until one guy came through, Reed Pierce. Okay. And for about two, maybe even three years, Reed Pierce played well, he, he won a, 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 right after he beat Junior. He won the big big bar table championship and won a big table championship. I think you, I've seen him on YouTube winning a, some kind of championship on that table. Yeah, he, he played both. And, uh, well, Reed, he played Reed, through and couldn't, couldn't handle it, Jimmy Reed. It, yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy uh, not Jimmy Reed. Reed Pierce. I'm, I'm, Reed, I'm, I'm thinking, I got the names next. Yeah, Reed, Reed Pierce. With a mullet. Long hair. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know him when he had a mullet, but he, he probably did it one time or another. I mean, look, look, if I got a picture of me bald over there, you know, uh, I changed my looks every year. I didn't want nobody knowing me. I played some people three or four times. They didn't know they were playing the same guy. Junior Brown's one of them. I played him three times up in Wichita. I never knew he played the same guy. And then Jack Schertz brings him down to cover my tables. I, I couldn't find anybody in Oklahoma that made me happy covering yes. tables. And that's when I had my first club in Pahuska. I just wasn't happy with the way he did it. So I called Jack Shirts up. I knew him. I lived up in Wichita for a while, worked at Boeing. And uh, my brother came up and stayed with me and uh, uh, kept track of the money I made on weekends playing pool. I was making three times as much money playing pool as I was working at Boeing, so I quit Boeing. But... Um, and I, now, uh, I lost track of what I was going to say. You were starting to tell me both sides of the story. The David Matlock, Matlock versus James Walker. Anyway, later, after I'd been in the business for three years, maybe three and a half, I went back over and played Dave. Uh, uh, at this time, Danny Dyson had sold his business to Ronnie Phoebus. And Phoebus wanted to put me in the box with him, with him giving me a ball in the break. Ball and the break. Or a ball in the break. I don't even know what that means. A ball, like the eight ball. Like the eight ball in the break. I got the break, and the, and I, he, I think he gave me the seven ball in the break. Not a lot. And he beat me. I I stayed ahead of him forever, and. Oh, for the first hour or so, but I never could take it off because I'm missing. You can't play those good players and give them an extra shot every four or five games. You just can't win. You're, you're gonna, they're, that extra shot's just going to eat you up. And uh, Matlock beat me. Uh, so even though you know there's a big difference between those three or four years of running a pool room and running a bar and not having any action. Oh, yeah. The last guy I played was Junior Brown that uh, came through with day, with, when they covered my tables. I remember I'm behind the bar with my brother, and I said, you know, Jack Shirts and him are over there work covering the tables. And I said, I'll tell you what's going to happen. They're going to come up here. And I'm still playing good right then. The first eight or nine months I had that bar, I still played good. And uh, I said, they're going to come up here. They're going to order a beer, and they're going to sit down. They're going to ask me if I likes to play pool. And Jack knew, uh, knew of me. He did. He didn't know anything about me, but uh, he heard that I'd gamble. So, you think you were in his book? 
<laughs> Whose book? <laughs> the book. The, the, you said the black book, you know, the, where you had all the players. Oh, no. Down no, on no, play, no I wasn't in nobody's book because uh, they, they didn't beat me. I didn't book a loser. I, I, I traveled Buddy Dennis. We, we traveled off and on for three years. Didn't book a loser. Traveled with Randy Burse. Randy was a guy that wore cowboy boots, cowboy shirt, and uh, all them Texas, Texas and uh, California players that come through, we'd just beat them all. We'd beat them all. And they called him Billy the Kid. Yeah. Billy Aguero also was another guy they called that. Yeah. And uh, Dad, give me I lost what I lost line of thought again. Well, we keep bouncing back to Cool. I, I do that. Um, I think if we if we stop Madlock, if we stop about the players for a minute and talk about billiard powers, I have some specific questions about it. Okay. Um, I know that you owned a, the bank shop was the first one. Mm -hmm. Was there another one in between there and the billiard palace? No. Okay. So so did you sell bank shop and then I sold it and then bought billiard palace or, or started it? Well, you know. Uh, um, by the time we opened the Billiard Palace, Laura and I were married. And uh, so she, she gets half the credit. She, oh yeah, more than that. More than half, because she's got to keep up with you and that. More than that, yeah. And she did our books for us and everything. And uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm getting a little tired. I think uh, my mind just isn't working right. All right. Well, let me ask this question, and Laura. Definitely help us out here. What do most people overlook when they open a pool room? What's what they what do they forget? To do well, most people think they can draw a, a bar stool up behind the cash register and make a living. Uh, if you, the, I learned from uh, Georgia Barrett. Georgia Barrett. And when Georgia I bought my first, she said she'd stay with me for a month and teach me how to run a bar, okay. and I learned a lot from Georgia. And I learned a lot from running the road and seeing different pool rooms and uh, different bars and everything. Yeah. And then, I don't know if you've heard of Greg Stevens. I have. Greg Stevens was a friend of mine, and I knew of him on the road. When he was down in Houston, he was beating every living human. But finally, Buddy Hall came through. You'll read books, you'll read stories that says Luther Lasker did it. It was Buddy Hall come through and beat Greg. And Greg immediately came up to Tulsa, opened the pool room up, knocked a home run. They kept going up on the rent. John Nallen kept going up on the rent on him. So he, he moved back to his hometown, which is Wichita. Okay. And in Wichita, he opened the room up on Pawnee and Oliver. And I'd go in there. And I, first time I went in there, he treated me kind of cold. I mean, we were friends, and he treated me a little cold. Uh, he, you know, he didn't. It wasn't negative or anything. It just it, it wasn't friendly like it usually is. So I, when I went home and uh, laid down, I went to the motel and laid down that night. I thought about it, and I snapped to what the deal was. He did not want pool players in his pool room. So the next day, when I got up, I went down and I saw him, and I said, "Greg." I promise you I will not play any pool in your pool room. I'll hit balls, but I will not gamble in your pool room, period. And now we're buddies again. You know, I'm over at the house eating lunch with him and everything. When I got ready to open my second room up, the big one, from, I had the first one. Mm -hmm. and I got ready to open it up. I went up and saw Greg. We did. It was noon when we went in, and he, we went all went out to lunch, and he eats like, uh, you know, Minnesota fats couldn't, hold a candle to him when it comes to devouring food. Okay. So as soon as we got through eating, we went to his house and he's telling me about how to run a pool room. Right I got now. a I got a legal pad and I'm just writing. Probably wrote six pages of the legal pad. Now I've got a funny way of writing. I did the same way as in college. I write diagonally across the page. And I remember that. You still do that? Uh-huh. And, uh, uh, yeah, if I'm taking notes. And 
So he writes down six pages of legal pad for you. And I, I had condensed it down to three little pieces of paper like this that I could carry around with me in my little handbook. Do you still have them? I do, but I don't know where they're at. Um, I'm not know. sure if you carried them around that long. You probably know what they say on it. Pretty much. Yeah, the main thing is Dick Lane took me into when the Fox and Hound opened their first pool room down in Dallas. Is that his deal? Mm -hmm. Did he open that? No, Dick Lane didn't open that one. He had clicks. Clicks. But a friend of his opened that one. Okay. And uh, he wanted to show me their bathroom. So we walk in the bathroom, and it's beautiful. Beautiful. It's got the tile is a mosaic. You know, it's just beautiful. And he, he's bragging on about it. And I said, yeah, man, you're right, Dick. I said, but look down to the floor, man. You're standing in a half inch of piss. I mean, I'd just as soon have an ordinary damn bathroom, bathroom with a, that's clean. And, you, you know, my wife can attest, every morning I was going in with Clorox and bleach. And I was supposed to add the two. I had a mask on or I'd th put my shirt up on my, you know. I'd go in there, Clorox and bleach, and uh, the women's bathroom, men's bathroom was clean every morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the day, you'd check it. Because one thing Greg Stevens did when I went to watch his pool room when he opened it up is every 15 minutes, somebody poked their head into the bathroom to make sure it was right. Mm. And uh, the tables got brushed, not like I did it, because he didn't have somebody hired specifically for that. But it got brushed at least four or five times a day, each one. Listen to this, guys. Uh, the billiard palace. Well, just walk me through the process. Well, when someone comes to the counter, I want to go play on table two. Well, my f deal is, uh, you you got to make your customer base happy. Um, you make more money if you've got good lighting on the table, if you keep the cloth looking great, and it's clean. I had somebody brush the table, wipe it down, wipe down where people sit. A woman could come in, know she's sitting in a clean chair with a with uh, everything's clean and you, you play pool for two hours on my table and there's nothing on your hand like there is in a lot of places because it's brushed. Is, this and, is kind of a show because this is before you get on your table. Right. This is like the presentation. Somebody's there giving like the brush. Waiter, like a waiter in a restaurant preparing your space for the, for the evening. And I've never seen anyone do it, but I really like it. I'd come in. I don't care. I'm just I'm going to practice hit balls. I'm not on a date. They're wiping the table down just the same. Doesn't matter. And then, then, and then the rails. Mm -hmm. And then I, I didn't realize that they were doing the, our, where we were sitting. But oh yeah. So there's one that stands out, big time, big time, big time, big time. And I didn't, uh, didn't gouge people with the, when they went to seventy five cents, we stayed at fifty cents on okay. our pool tables. And, uh, you know, I made more money. Because the table stayed busy all the time. You know, and I didn't rely on pool players. I had, uh, I learned from Greg Stevens, you know, you can wa you, you walk in a big pool room like that one, uh, 45 tables, 43 tables. 43 tables in there. And, uh, and uh, you wa walk into that and you, and you look around and you'll see three, four tables where pool players are in action. Mm -hmm. The rest have saw fun players. I mean, that place would be full, especially on the weekends. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. We had a wait list almost every night, yeah. Imagine having a pool room with over 40 tables and a waiting list on it. And sometimes you could come in at 5 o'clock in the morning and you couldn't get a table. Because we stay now, open 24 talk, hours. Let's, let's talk about how you handle it when your tables, tables are full. This is a positive problem to have. How did you handle a waiting list? Let's talk about that. Well, we just write their names down. Keeping track of it like that. And at the old beer palace where we only had uh, 14 tables, um, we get uh, a legal pad sheet full, three pages, people wanting to play pool. That's why I had to go. To, when we first opened the, the new beer palace up, it was 10,000 square foot. Then I went to 13.5. Because it's all in the shopping center. When this place would go empty next to me, I'd 
open it up and I'd open it. I ended up 18.5. The sandwich place, was that as far as, wasn't there like a place to get us? We to took over the place? sandwich place at the end. There was a subway? Yeah, we took it over at the end. That's where the card table went. Well, it was huge. It was definitely a palace compared mm -hmm. to any other pool room. At the um, time, yeah. You could have about any type of bar table table bar table tournament you wanted, right? Yeah, I think we had eighteen bar tables. And how many nine foot? Oh. We might have had more than that bar tables because we had probably had two, we had two we had uh, two snooker tables and at one time two uh, three cushion tables. Okay. Because we had a waiting list for the three cushion all the time, so we put two of them in. Yeah, I remember coming up here watching. Uh, when Alex Pegmon and James matched up, and Don Cacharo was with Alex. He's in there, had a good rack of eyeball on the snooker table, making balls from everywhere. All right. 24 hour place. You ever, you ever been there? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. 24 hour place. Food, 24 hours? No, I don't think it was 24 hours. I think we opened it in the morning and, uh, we did it two ways. Uh, uh, sometimes it, we we closed during a certain period of time and then opened again for the next meal. But and you only serve the beer till till, till late. two o'clock. Well, yeah. it had to be off the floor too. I remember uh, the guy that came chief of police, as a matter of fact, was the first cop in the, that had my district at the old palace, and. Uh, when he came to see me about a 24-hour room in his town, you know, they, it, it was a, not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I told him, I said, listen, I'll have all the beer up by two. And he, he looked at me and he said, how about five to two? I said, at five to two, we'll have all the beer up. <laughs> it, you remember that cop, the cop statue, like mm -hmm. seven-foot-tall plastic cop in full, like, dress? Yeah. yeah. That was at the billiard palace, right? Was yeah, that we, now we, it's at Magoo's. It was at Magoo's last. last. When I, Magoo's was open later, but we had that, and uh, we had a couple of them at, at, at the palace. I forget which ones we were. I know the cops. We had two cops. Well, I mean, just imagine you're you're entering the pool room for the first time, and you don't know it's there, but it's this giant <laughs> police officer in full dress right by the door. So you can't forget it. Well, you know, at the first. Bigger Palace, Sam Shawnhorse, Donnie Falks, Mike Betts, and myself. We wasn't going to have much trouble. Yeah, I bet. Um, my wife would show up for work early to do the books. I'd be going home about that time. Okay. I don't want to leave her alone at five, well, at five in the morning, you know. Sure. Sam Shawnhorse come down and have coffee. And, you know, a couple of times, you know, somebody was in there once, I remember, had a beer head under their jacket. And she said something to Sam, says, oh, I got to go talk to that guy. He said, well, go ahead. So she went over and says, you know, you need to leave. You can't, you can't have that beer in here. And he, she didn't know it, but Sam was standing right behind her and the guy left, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm over there. Um, okay. There's all kinds of stories like that, but um, pool rooms are neat. Tell, tell me something uh, about, okay, so you sold liquor and beer, right? Uh, yeah. Liquor, beer, beer? Now, at the new beer palace, all we had was beer. Okay. Um, you had foosball tables, too? We that? put them in later, yeah. We had 12 foosball tables at the very Arts. back of the room. I don't believe we did it at the palace. We did it a little while ago. Do we have darts at the palace? Okay. I don't remember that, see. Yeah. You're not a dart player or a foosball player, right? No. No, and I hated foosball. But, you know, there a lot of foosball players like that. I know we had to listen to more ACDC than foosball players play that ACDC like crazy. Okay, let's talk about music in a pool room. Because you guys had it before the digital jukebox. I know you had a jukebox where it was like CDs, right? Well, Who picked the music on the jukebox? The, put the uh, music in a pool room or even my bar. I 
am very adamant about I'm, I love music. As you know, of course, my brother being a musician doesn't hurt anything. But I never had anything on there that would be abusive or anything. I was even in the New Palace when they came out with the new deals. I told the guy when he put it in, "You got to borrow all this stuff, mm-hmm. or you can't. You know, I won't put it in." I, the first the first bar I opened in Pahuska, my vendor wouldn't show up to fix a uh, pinball machine until the next Monday, and it went out on Thursday. I got to sit there all weekend with a piece of broken equipment in my bar. In my bar, I don't do that. If a light bulb's out, I couldn't stand it. Right. And I told him just pick his stuff up Monday. If you can't come in, and Monday come get your stuff and take it back with you. He laughed at me. You know, this was back in the 70s. He laughed at me and he said, you know, you can't buy a bar table. You can't buy a jukebox. You can't buy, you know, there's, you just couldn't buy anything. Couldn't buy any kind of video games or, or any, there wasn't no video games, pinball machines or anything like that. So what I had to do, I had an Akai, eight, real, eight inch real Akai that uh, I uh, when I was in the Navy, I was in the Navy with a kid that did the music for Vanilla Fudge. He was their sound man. And he made me about four reels of great music, 60s and 70s music. And when I got out, uh, when I kicked him out, I moved that in there. And no, it didn't cost anybody anything, and they listened to the great music. I just, and I had to go buy some pool tables. And I talked to uh, Verl Horn, called him up, and I said, Verl, I need some pool tables. You know how I can get some? He said, well, Bill Dugan has got 100 pool tables. He had several bars. He had like 20-some bars out near the panhandling out there, Woodward and out. So he said, I'll see if we can get. So I bought three pool tables off of Bill Dugan. Verl set it up and uh, brought them back. It, my room only had room for two pool tables, and I put one underneath the deal for spare parts. Okay. And uh, learned to work, work on pool tables and everything. But um, I, I've never had a vendor since until we got Brad Zach. And vendor, vendor relationships, pool owners. <laughs> Don't let your equipment sit in there not working. Yeah. Uh, well... He just said the wrong thing to you, didn't he? He was just like, you can't get these. Boy, he's a nice guy, and he was a veteran. And, you know, I do. I wanted to work with him, but I'm not going to have broken equipment in my place. I, yeah. I like what you said about the bathrooms, too. Because, it was, you know, we have a, a really clear visual of the pool tables. Bathrooms are important, probably more important than I would know. Way more important. How about... Especially uh, for the women. How but, about what... This is just kind of my personal opinion. I think if you have a great staff and... <laughs> The management of that staff, it's got to be a lot easier. So you guys probably hired how many people? Hundreds of people. Hundreds. Of people. Over the years, yeah. Um, tell me, tell me, tell me what you learned there, and what, what best tough people to hire and not hire on. You know, that, that's really hard to say, isn't it? I just, uh, uh, you know, yeah. You, 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 that's kind of, I think, a gut feeling about whether you hire somebody. I was real lucky. Some of the people that I hired were people that I knew that were pool players and, and uh, knew, you know, like Earl Schrock, who I grew up with. He, he became kind of a manager at the, uh, new, at the Old Palace. And, uh, and Terry was, you know, got to get introduced to Terry by Earl. And he was really great. And... Um, how about servers? Because, you know, sometimes you go to a pool room or even a bar now, and it's kind of like the bowling alley. You're going up there to get your drinks. Um, and all of y'all, both of y'all's places, you've got a server that's going to come over, and you can just, like, she's not there within 15 minutes. She, she didn't come in, but she's there every 15. Or What was the kind of the... Well, I, ha- I had... Uh pretty good servers. I, I trained them a little bit. And I, some, somebody did. We had, at, at Magoo's, we had some real good deals. We'd like to see that, the picture of my brother there playing. Uh, at, at, the more you write, that's him playing at uh, Sunset Grill. Okay. And uh, the Sunset Grill, uh, 
you could sit there and never get a drink if you don't go to the bar. Right. And they would be busy and making money. And a lot of people like to say, you know, they're leaving more money laying down on the floor than they are, than they're making. You know, they, they could be making a lot more money if they had service. And uh, I just wanted what I wanted. If I'm at a place, I want somebody to come up and take care of me. me and and uh, so that's, you got to hire enough. Like I had a guy that all he was there for was to check people on and off and brush tables. That's all he's, that's all he had to do. And I, uh, you know, I'd have, I'd give a girl an area and Did if she didn't, him? was he cashier too? He was, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they'd pay him. Ex except at the old palace, you know, but the first club I opened, people kind of, I don't know, they wouldn't get discouraged, but they, what are you doing? You know, I'd be there every five minutes. If they smokers, I'd be dumping their ashtray. And I'd do it myself. My brother and I, and then we usually have, when we're busy, we'd have one girl working. I've had as many as two at that bar, but that's it. Especially you had, to, I had to have more when I had those uh, bikers come in. Chris, you're at one forty. Goodness. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's uh let's wrap it up in the next couple minutes. I want to ask. First of all, since you're here now, I got to tell you about my trip with you two when I was a teenager. You guys loaded up what looked like a church van and took us to DeKalb, Illinois. Um, somehow I lucked out and I won like a qualifier. I'm in the bus with Shane McMahon, Michelle McDermott, your daughter and uh, probably seven other kids. And we stopped like three times to eat. Every, the first time freaked me out, and then I just got used to it. Get there, Jim, before even, before the menus are passed out, he orders pie. Right then, I'm like, and he's the man, right? We're all just little kids, like, he ordered pie, and some of them were used to it, like your daughter, and I'm sure some of the other people, this was typical of you. I just couldn't believe it. I was like, we're gonna can I get dessert? And you both go, yeah, you can have dessert. I go, <laughs> all right. And then we did it again. We stopped again. We had dessert. Oh, yeah, I loved it. I'd never met anybody or seen that. And, uh, I also remember you getting on to us. You were our road mom. Yeah. Got your room. Anything. Didn't matter what we were doing. You, you kept us in line. <laughs> you didn't have to do anything but look at us. Just give us a look. Um, so I want to ask about Magoo's, just for a touch, because we talked about Billiard Palace. Can you explain the differences in the places, Billiard Palace versus Magoo's? Well, Billiard Palace was a 24-hour place, number one, didn't serve alcohol, and um, the bar tables, uh, and, well, the tables stayed real busy. At Magoo's, the table stayed fairly busy, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the alcohol, the music, uh, my brother played music there a lot. So the music, was your creation there, or was it already there? I built, built, I built it, so no, there wasn't nothing already there. Okay, so uh, when, you, when you first come in and look to the right at Magoo's, I don't know what it is now. There might be some games. Yeah, I haven't been in since I sold it. But it used to be just they kind music of, right there, right? Uh -huh. They used to have good barbecue sandwiches. I mean, like, if I wanted to get my fiance or my girlfriend to come out on a date with me to a pool room, and there's music playing, we probably could stay there most of the night. I mean, I feel like I've taken people to Magoo's who have never been to a pool room, and it almost just ruins them. Because they think that this is what pool rooms look like. Well, Magoo's is not a normal pool room. You won't find one like it in America. It's it's hard to describe because I like for it to be kind of described as an adult entertainment spot, but that sounds like it might be some kind of girly place or something. Yeah. Um, it's just you know good food, uh, good atmosphere. Uh, we love the seating there. I love the raised bar where you, when you're up at the bar area, you can see everything, mm -hmm. like the matches. 
And I also like how you add the seating for, for watching and, and viewing matches. There's not one bad table in there as far as seating. Yeah. So there's maybe one. It's uh, 13,200 square foot. Do you ever go in the room in the back where you have the pro tournaments? You mean when they had to get in a hole in their building? They, yeah. You walked out the back door of a goose and walked in another door and had all the, all the non all the pros. How'd you like to have the, the bleachers, biggest bleachers? biggest pool room in the state, Chris? And then you got to grow because you can't hold people. That's got to be the best feeling. We used it mainly for um, senior tours and camel pro tours. I've got the boards for the camel pro tours, oh. too. And did you did you rent those buildings or buy those? Buildings? Rent. Rented. That was a big mistake I made. That was one of the mistakes I made over time. After I got successful, I should have bought something, mm -hmm. but I rented instead. And if it hadn't been for the home invasion, I probably would have still been in the business. But that slowed me down too much. Set me too far back. Um, place don't make it if they don't have somebody running it that really loves running it. You know, if you're doing something that you really like. I, I don't blame the, my managers, but they, they didn't have enough guidance, you know. Vinny was real good, but, you know, he needed guidance. And uh, one gal that worked for us, Kimmy, she did real good. She was really good for us. Did All a lot right. of the training of my waitresses. Um, I want to say, uh, obviously, I want to say thank you. For, for doing this interview with us, um, especially we're almost at two hours now. Um, yeah, I wore myself out, I think. Yeah, you're talking a lot slower, actually. Um, but this is, this means everything to me. Uh, like I said, my dad, it would, when I, luckily enough, he was around when I was a kid playing pool to look out for me. And he always pointed at, at Jim and, and Laura McDermott as, if you're going to be in the pool world, you know, make this your thing, these are the people to watch. You know, you kind of remind me of my dad, like real strict. You're, 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 everything's done a certain way and focused. Well, you know, the old man that had the pool room that I grew up in, where I met uh, all those guys that had a little bit to do with training me, I grew up in a pool room where there were adults and kids, small town. If you put the if you're playing pool and you take the chalk and you put it down the wrong way face down, you'd hear these footsteps coming back at you. He's that's Henry running up to grab you by the arm and say, "You dirty little son of a bitch." You know he did, he didn't didn't want that. You can't make me put the chalk face down on on the rail now. Right. You just couldn't make me do it. I I could. <laughs> Well, there's um, certain things in a pool room that you learn that you, you know, you do it a certain way and the uh, 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 protocol. You got guys with suits coming in, you know, like Mike Betts, uh, you know, Baylor the Taylor back here. Uh, Baylor the Taylor. Yeah, he was Mike Betts's Taylor. Okay. And Mike, uh, he, he, he uh, oh, we got we got several of them. Uh. Some of them are over here, I know. And uh, oh, that's you, Laura, when you're young. Yeah. Yep. How <laughs> old? Young. Real young. I think it's uh, when you were eighteen, seventeen, or something. Um. So, so I've learned, uh, for example, the turn. Don't try it. Technical. Don't try it until um, you, it does. You're going to put it really some time in on it. I've got questions to ask you later uh, about the pool. Of course, I'm a pool player. Mm -hmm. um, I know that some of our viewers are going to probably have some questions about pool rooms. And I think that uh, they can give us some questions. The next time we see you, we'll ask them. Mm -hmm, good. Yeah, when you set up a pool room, you get, there's a lot of things about having a milling area and having a uh, uh, the electricity in the right spot, and uh, it, there's a lot to it. Well, if I open one, which not anytime soon, I'm gonna come with my yellow pad. Yeah, do a Greg. <laughs> but I did to Greg Stevens, sure. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. You know, I didn't take uh, everything 
Greg said to, to uh, all the way, but uh, I'd use some of it. You know, yeah. That's probably what you'd do with mine. You just Everybody's got their own real ideas of what they want to do. Yeah. I changed things from Greg's way of doing it to my way of doing it, but I used a lot of his ways too. Learned a lot of Georgia from Georgia Barrett. All right, you ready for me to sign off? Thank you guys for watching this. Um, please like, subscribe, and share this channel, the Fooling Around Show. Um, the more you like uh, and share it, uh, the more it motivates us to do it and keep coming and getting these interviews. Thank you so much for having us in your home. I enjoyed it. And um, look forward to the next time we can do it. Yeah, it'd be nice. <laughs>